Uh, I want to say one more time, if you are a guest or a visitor in our house, we are so glad that you are here this morning. Uh, we couldn't be happier that you are in our house, and uh, we are pretty excited about what God's doing around here. Uh, we see Him moving, we see Him working, and we're so happy uh, about that. I want to tell you about something that went on yesterday, and maybe you knew about it, and maybe you didn't, but uh, yesterday we had a back-to-school giveaway, and uh, 98 people came out and got clothes from that, and 36 kids received school supplies uh, through your generosity. And so uh, we're so thankful for that. Could we give God a hand for what he's doing? 36 kids are going back with what they need. And so we're so thankful that God is using us to make a difference in our community. Amen. I want to jump right into the message this morning. Uh, the last few weeks we've been talking about our core values, the things that we believe so deeply uh, that it changes the way we live, both as uh, individuals and the way we run as an organization, as the body of Christ. We believe these things to our very core. In the first week we said, in this house, Jesus is center. He is center. He is everything to us. In week two, we said grace is greater. Greater than your past, greater than your present, greater than your future. Grace, God's grace can surpass all of your bad choices. In week three, we said that relationships are greater than rules. We were created for a relationship. We were not created to follow a set of rules and regulations. And then last week we said, we is greater than me. We need each other. We need to live in community with one another. We need each other. That person sitting next to you, you need that person. And so this week I'm going to do something just a little bit different. We're going to double up over the next couple weeks because I have somewhere I want us to get to. Uh, at the end of August, and so we're going to kind of press the fast-forward button on this. We still want to cover everything. We still want to talk about everything, but uh, we're going to speed up just a little bit. Is that okay? Uh, the two core values that we're going to talk about today, the first one is generosity changes lives. Generosity changes lives. And the second one is choose love. Choose love. And so before we get any farther into the message, I want us to take just a moment and pray one more time, and then we will get into the meat of the message. And so pray with me and for me if you would. Uh, God, we come to you, and God, we realize that the things in this book, your word, are far beyond our understanding. But God, we thank you that your Holy Spirit can reveal these things to us. God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would take the blinders off of our eyes and off of our hearts this morning. God, make our hearts fertile ground, ready to receive your word. God, we want to know and understand you better. God, we want to see what you're saying to us today. God, we, uh, we need you desperately in this moment. God, just take over my mouth. Control what I say, God. Lord, Help everything I say point to you and you alone. God, we love you and we thank you for everything. And it's through Jesus we pray. Amen. Um, the reason that we're talking about both of these ideas together, uh, the ideas of generosity changes lives and the, uh, choose love, is because in the Hebrew way of thinking, loving and giving are connected. They're uh, almost interchangeable. In the Hebrew way of thinking, to love was to give, and to give was to love. So you can't love someone if you are not willing to give to them, and you can't give to someone if you do not love them. Are you following me? Do you know what I, do you know what I mean? You, you understand this. You all are smart people. If... Your husband, ladies, is not willing to give you his time or his attention, his energy, or part of his paycheck, you don't feel loved, right? One of those speaks to you and says, when you give me this, 
I feel your love. It's connected. The ideas of giving and loving are connected. And I want to do something a little different. Uh, I'm going to talk about both of these ideas individually, but from the same passage of Scripture. And so if you have your Bible, uh, Matthew 5 is where we are today. Matthew 5, and we're going to start in verse 38. 5 verse 38. If you don't have your Bible, there's one right in front of you, a gold, um, a gold Bible. And that's yours to keep if you don't have a Bible at home. We want everybody to have one of those if you don't have one at home. Matthew 5, starting in verse 38. This is Jesus talking in the Sermon on the Mount, one of the most famous sermons ever preached. And this is what he says. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and it sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now I want to take just a few moments and unpack some of this scripture. We don't have time to get to it all, but I want us to focus in on verse 41. Um, it says, and if anyone... I forces you to go one mile, go with him two mile. But I need to give you some context so that you can understand the weight of this passage to Jesus' first century audience. Uh, it's a little hard for us to understand when Jesus says, if anyone forces you to go one mile. Can I just take a poll right now? Did anybody, when you were walking down the street this week, did somebody pull up and... Uh, in a van, jump out with a gun and say, you have to walk with me one mile. Did that happen with anybody? I mean, your wife may have made you walk one mile to exercise this week, but probably nobody forced you to walk a mile with them. Right? It's not something that we understand in our culture. Nobody can force you to walk anywhere if you don't want to. Somebody can ask you to, and most of us will say, no, I don't want to walk anywhere. That's what we'll say. But in this culture, you need to understand that the nation of Israel was controlled by Rome. And that meant that all throughout the nation, there were Roman soldiers stationed to kind of keep control of this country. And... They made the Israelites pay taxes, but they also forced some other laws on them. And one of those laws said that if you're walking down the street and you're a Jewish man or a Jewish woman, and a Roman soldier needs to have something carried for a mile, he can force you to carry whatever it was for one mile. Didn't matter what you was doing, didn't matter how busy you were, didn't matter if you were headed to work, it, it, was, it was beyond all that. If he needed you to carry something, you had to drop everything you had going on and go with him one mile. One mile. It didn't have to go any farther than a mile, but just one mile. And so I want you to imagine if you were a Jewish man, maybe you were late for work and and headed out to try to make your living, you're walking down the street, 
you know, probably in a rush trying to get to wherever you're going. You see a Roman soldier and he's carrying a bag of potatoes. If he needs you to carry that bag of potatoes, he can say, here, carry this. And even if it's in the opposite direction of where you're going, you have to carry that for one mile. And so you're not just carrying it one mile, but you also have to walk back one mile. So you're inconvenienced two miles. I don't know how fast you walk, but it's at least 20 minutes one way. 40 minutes all together, best you can do. So a Roman soldier can put you out of your way for 40 minutes, essentially. I wonder if they had any people at the end of the one mile to ever say, you know what, I've enjoyed our time together so much. Could I carry that another mile? I bet they didn't have a problem with that. I bet that never happened. Do you know what I'm saying? I I bet these Roman soldiers never seen anybody who would offer to carry their whatever it was, their box, their bag, their equipment, another mile. Jesus is giving us an example of the kind of generosity that we are to have as his followers. People didn't go the second mile. Have you heard of going the extra mile? This is where that comes from. Nobody wanted to go the extra mile because the Romans were their enemies. They hated the Romans. They had to pay taxes to the Romans. If this was about April during tax season, you would know exactly what this felt like. You would hate paying taxes to these people who don't care what you have to say. They hated the Romans, and so nobody wanted to do anything for the Romans except hit them over the side of the head. But I could just imagine that when Jesus is given this illustration of how you are to be generous to the people around you, when he said, when someone forces you to go one mile, go with them too, I bet the disciples sucked air. That's not what they wanted to hear. The disciples did not want to hear because I'm sure they had all carried something a mile. I'm sure that they had at some point carried something that was heavy a mile. And so this is not what the disciples or the people who were around there wanted to hear. But Jesus was setting a standard for generosity. He was, he was setting a standard beyond anybody's ability to be humanly generous. Nobody is that generous. We all know people who are naturally generous. They're just naturally open-handed. They'll give you the shirt off their back. But no human is naturally this generous. They might go with them the first mile without complaining, but there's not a chance they're going the second mile. Not for their enemy. Not for the people who they hate. They're not going the second mile. Jesus gives us this illustration for two reasons. The first one is this kind of generosity. The kind of generosity that should mark his followers is not natural. You don't get this on your own. You have to have an encounter with a generous God to acquire this kind of generosity. It's not natural, it has to be supernatural. Most of us are not naturally generous, right? Could we be honest this morning? You all look tired. Most of us are not naturally generous. We want to give up to the point that's expected of us, And we want to get as close to the line without going over a penny more than we have to. We don't want to give a penny extra. And that's okay. We're all like that. Some of you are naturally generous and we appreciate you and we want you to be our friend. But most of us are not naturally 
generous. Most of us naturally want to keep to ourselves. We want to hold to ourselves. And that's why people are always arguing about whether the law of the tithe is still relevant today. You know why? Because we're stingy. We're selfish. We're greedy. And I, I just submit to you, this is off subject just a tad, but Jesus, it really doesn't matter whether the tithe applies or not because Jesus upped the ante in the New Testament. He didn't say just give 10%, but he told one man, go and sell everything you own. Give it to the poor and follow me. Jesus upped the ante. It doesn't matter if that 10% is an obligation. Jesus says, I'm going to make you give until it hurts. Give until it hurts. In the book of Acts, in the second chapter, we can see that in the New Testament church, these people who had been... In who had encountered the risen Lord, they didn't just give a little bit, but they gave everything they had. Nobody was forcing them to. In the new covenant, nobody can force you to give anything. I will not show up at your house to collect your tithe. Will not. Nobody from this church will knock on your door and say, Hey, notice you've not been paying your tithe. It's not going to happen. No, in the new covenant, nobody can force you to do anything. But our heart is transformed. Amen. And we want to give because we understand how much God has given to us. When we see the generosity of God, when we're reborn in His image, it's natural, supernatural, for us to give out of a generous heart. We've been transformed, and so it really doesn't matter if the 10% is relevant or not, because God's going to give you a generous heart, and you're not going to care about that 10% anymore. So there's that. Uh, these Roman soldiers never seen anybody go the extra mile. I can just imagine after this sermon... When the first disciple who got called on by a Roman actually did this. Think about this. They get to the end of the first mile. And one of the disciples or one of the people who heard um, Jesus say this. They say, hey, can I go with you one more mile? The Roman soldiers would have had no filter for this. They would have, their mind would have been blown. Could you imagine what they must have been thinking? Are you crazy? What are you doing? You don't have to go the extra mile. But the kind of generosity that Jesus is calling you and me to goes over the top. Goes beyond obligation. Goes beyond what you have to give. That's the kind of generosity that God calls you and me into and not just calls us into, but gives us the opportunity to be a part of. It's an opportunity. The idea of generosity, it means to be liberal in giving. To be liberal in giving. To just be over the top. Give everything you can. What if we were a church that instead of uh, giving as little as we can to get by, what if we gave as much as we could and still get by. Wouldn't that be amazing? I think that being a generous church is of the highest compliment that we could receive. We want to be identified by our generosity. Not just in our money, but in our time and our energy, the way we serve people. We want to be known as a generous church. Not just standard generosity, but over-the-top generosity. We want to be described as givers. Those people, they don't want something from you. They want to give you something. Not just giving to the people who we like, but giving to the people who have treated us bad, giving to the people who have talked about us bad, we want to be givers to every single person. I was thinking about this. 
early this morning, and uh, I, I just decided that I'd rather get to heaven knowing that I'd gave my way into, into poverty than saved my way into prosperity. I, I think I'd rather give my way into poverty, if that's even possible. I want to be known as a generous person. A few months ago, I talked about we need to get to heaven empty-handed. Everything in this life is temporary. If you can see it, hear it, touch it, taste it, feel it, it's temporary. Only for a moment. That money that you are working so hard for is temporary. One day it will be gone. It will be used and when you die, somebody else will spend it on something irresponsible. They will. Don't cling too tightly to something that is temporary. Cling to something that is eternal. We need to be a people who are always raising our standard of giving, not our standard of living. We don't need to be more comfortable. We need to be more intentional with our money. God gives to us, listen to this, this is important. God gives to us so that we can give back into the kingdom and be a part of what He's doing on planet earth. God gives to you so you can give back to Him and you can be part of what He's doing on planet earth. It's an opportunity to give, not an obligation. It's an opportunity, not an obligation. I can, when you look at the book of Acts, this kind of generosity that we've been talking about, the over the top kind of generosity, it changed the world. Rome was the strongest empire that had ever been on the face of the planet. And in 300 years, Rome was Christian because of this kind of generosity. People cannot resist this kind of generosity. And when you begin giving without worrying about yourself, when you start giving, to, I'm not talking about what you give at church, okay? I, I'm not trying to up the offering this morning. I'm not trying to get you to give more or make you feel bad about not giving. Let me make that clear. I'm talking about individual generosity given to people who are in need. I, I hope you give to this church because we want to keep the lights on and we want to keep meeting in this air-conditioned room, okay? That's good. Everybody like air conditioning this morning? Your money that you put in the offering plate when it comes around, that makes that happen. That makes that happen. But I'm talking about the kind of generosity that is beyond these four walls. See a, see a need, meet a need. Amen. See somebody who you can help meet that need. I'm not asking you to end world hunger. I'm just asking you to help the family down the road that needs your help. Do what you can. Guys, you're not going to be held responsible for the things that God never gave you. You, you're not going to be held responsible for anything God's not giving you. Some of you are worried about what God's not giving you. I don't have enough money to do this. He give you enough money to do something. He, he give you exactly what you need to do what He's called you to do. He's give this church exactly what we need to do what He's calling us to do in this moment. He, he's given us enough. Enough. We just have to trust Him to let it go. We just have to trust Him to let it go. We are to be a generous people. I want to switch gears right now uh, to go to our second core value. And we'll just transition with we give because we love and we love because we give. Um, let's go back to the scripture. Verse 43. Is where we're going to pick up. Uh, Jesus says, You have heard 
that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. This is the kind of love that the world has. Nobody struggles with this kind of love. We all have this kind of love mastered. If you're good to me, I love you. If you're bad to me, I hate you. Anybody struggle giving this kind of love this morning? Anybody can give this kind of love. Conditional love. Love based on how you treat me. Love based on what you've done for me or didn't do for me. Jesus is saying this is the kind of love that the world has for each other. But then he says, But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. Jesus is teaching that there's two different kinds of love. There's, an emo- there's a, a love based on emotion, on what I feel. If you're good to me and I feel good about you, I love you. But if you do bad to me and I feel bad about you, I hate you. That's the world's kind of love. But Jesus is saying, see, if Jesus was talking about an emotion we would all be missing the mark because anybody in here have enemies? Just just raise your hand. Don't act like you don't. There's somebody when you see them at Walmart, you duck behind the aisle. There's somebody that when you see them out, you walk the other way hoping they don't see you. Don't act like you're spiritual. Don't act like you don't have problems. We all have problems. We all have people we don't want to talk to who done us bad, talked bad about us. Right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wager this morning that you don't feel the emotion of love when you see your enemy. You don't feel a warm, fuzzy sensation in your belly when you see that person at Walmart. You don't feel love, do you? That's not what you're experiencing. You're experiencing quite the opposite. And so how do you love somebody who you don't have emotions for, at least positive emotions. It's not about an emotion. When you see that person who spread that horrible rumor about you, I bet you don't have butterflies in your stomach, do you? Oh, I'm just so happy to see them. And you won't ever, you will never get butterflies in your stomach for the person who, who done you bad and stole your money. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about the kind of love that is a decision. Love is a decision. You have to decide to love somebody. Especially if you're going to love them for the long haul. You have to make a decision that I'm going to dig in and I'm going to love you. I'm going to dig my heels in and love you no matter what you do to me. You can talk bad about me, you can do me bad, you can steal from me, whatever you want to do, but I'm going to love you anyway. Love is a decision, it's an action that we take. It's saying that no matter what, I love you. That's the kind of love that Jesus is calling us to have towards our enemies. The kind of love that says, I'm going to go out of my way to serve you and to talk good about you and to love on you every time I see you. That's what Jesus is talking about. See, most people are willing to love their neighbor as long as their neighbor looks just like them. Most people are willing to love their neighbor as long as they look like them and talk like them and believe like them and go to the same church that they go to and they vote like them and and all these other things. We're willing to love people who are just like us. The true test comes when people are not like us. 
As soon as people disagree with us or do something that we disagree with, our love for them seems to cease. We're willing to love our neighbor as long as our neighbor's not addicted to drugs. We're willing to love our neighbor as long as our neighbor's not living in a homosexual lifestyle. We're willing to love our neighbor as long as our neighbor hasn't stole anything off of us. But Jesus didn't say, love them until they hurt you. Love them until they disagree with you. Love your enemy. There's no qualifier on this passage of Scripture. There is no excuse. Some people, when you tell them they need to love that person, they'll say, but you don't understand. You're right, and I don't have to. You have to love them. If you are a born-again believer, you are obligated to love that person. No questions asked. It doesn't matter what they've done to you, said about you, if they disagree with you, you are called to love that person. Even your enemy. That includes everybody. Love your neighbor or love your enemy. Everybody falls in one of them two categories. Love everyone. Jesus is calling us to love the people who are around us. We can't love people who are a long way from us, but we can love the people who are close to us. What if instead of gossiping about our neighbor and the loud music they play at night, what if you went over and cut their yard? Wouldn't that be a much more productive way to spend your time? Instead of... Instead of... Fighting with your husband or wife about whatever's going on. Why don't you go out of your way to serve them? Cook them dinner. Clean the house. Wash the dishes. What if instead of, instead of worrying about whether they're talking about you or not, why don't you write them a note and tell them how you appreciate them? Love is an action. Love is not love until you put feet under it. You cannot say, I love you, and never go out of your way to serve that person. You have to put action to your words. Rarely will love ever beckon you to do anything that's easy. Could we get that out of the way right now? Love will rarely ask you to do something that's easy. Loving people is hard. Loving people is hard. Loving people is hard. I want you to be prepared for this, because when you try it, you're going to be like, that person's hard to get along with. It's hard to love them. You ever met somebody that was hard to love? Oh, yeah. yeah. (laughs) You have. If you haven't, You are that person. But (laughs) loving people is what we're called to do in the good times, in the bad times. When it's easy, when it's difficult. And I want to give you a, a litmus test kind of how to know when you're loving people right. Okay? There's a a right way and a a wrong way to love people. Okay? When people start saying about your love for people, isn't that a little irresponsible to do that? To give them that? To loan them that? To do that for them? Isn't that a little irresponsible? Don't you think that that money could have been stewarded a little better? That's what Christian people will tell you. You should be managing your money better than that. You could have, that's what Judas said. That's, you could have fed 50 people with what you give that person. Yeah, but I really made an impact in that one person's life. You can make a bigger impact giving $50 to one person than giving $1 to 50 people. 
You need to focus your love. When people start saying, don't, don't you think that's a little over the top? Isn't that a little too far to love that person? That's when you're starting to get a hold of how Jesus calls us to love people. Isn't that a little too far? Shouldn't, I, I don't think you should have went hardly that far. When people start saying you shouldn't have spent that money to show that person love, you're on the right track. Uh, we want to go over the top in our love for people, and here's why. Because Jesus went over the top in his, in his love for us. He went over the, top, over the top, beyond what he had to do. And so, what I want you to understand from today's sermon is not that you need to go work harder and try harder to love people. Uh, I want you to understand that 1 John 4.19 says that we love because he first loved us. We don't love people so God will love us. We love God, we, God loved us, and so out of an overflow from that, we love other people. Amen. We love other people. First John says, I've been reading it. If you don't have nothing to read right now, you should go over to First John. It's a good read. But First John says, if you claim to love God and you won't love your brother, you're a liar. Our love for our brother reveals our love for God. It's proof, evidence of our love for God. And not just our love for God, but His love for us. Love always is a choice. And so this week, you're going to have some choices to make. You're going to have some choices to make. And you're going to be able, you're going to have the choice to decide whether you will... Run away from love because love is hard. Or if you'll choose love, no matter what it costs you. Could I encourage you to choose love? Choose love even when it's difficult. Choose love even when it's not easy. Choose love. Go out of your way to serve the people who are around you. Go out of your way to help those people who have hurt you. Do that because that's what Jesus done for you. In John 13, 34 and 35, it says, this is Jesus talking, He says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Listen to this. This, this is hard. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know you are my disciples if you have loved one another. The same kind of over-the-top love Christ showed you is the same kind of love you're to show the person you hate. I know it's not easy. But Jesus set the high standard of love. The high standard of love. And then he says, I want you to do the same. And it's when he said it, he said right after that, this is how people will know you're my disciple. When you love like Jesus, it sets you apart from the world. You don't have to dress in a weird way to be set apart from the world. You don't have to watch certain TV shows to be set apart from the world. You have to love like Jesus. You have to love like Jesus. You can't counterfeit love. You can't counterfeit love. When you're loving and serving people, it has to be real because it costs you something. Let me show you something in Romans 5.10. It says... For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled, saved by, we shall be saved by His life. 
Paul said in Romans, we were enemies of God. We were enemies of God. And so when Jesus said, love your enemies, he, what he was really saying is, I'm about to show you what that means. Jesus didn't ask something of us that he wasn't willing to do himself. Jesus, we were his enemies. While we were still his enemies, he gave up everything for us. Some of you have never thought of yourself as an enemy of God. But when you're living on your own without the grace of God on your life, you are an enemy of God. Living opposed to Him. But while we were enemies of God, God showed us the grace that we are to show the people around us. While we were enemies, while we were separated from God, God gave the most valuable thing that He had, His Son, to His enemies. Have you thought about that? Would you give up the person you love the most for a person who hated you the most? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. You wouldn't. But God did. That's the kind of over-the-top love that God showed towards us. He inconvenienced Himself to the point of the cross. To show us love. Amen. To show us love. He done, God done everything in His power to keep you from destruction. Church, I want to let you know this morning that there is still a heaven and there is still a hell. Real places. And at the end of this age, people will go to both places. But I want you to know this, that God done everything that He could to keep every single human being out of that place called hell. And so we have a choice today. A choice. We can choose to accept God's love and His grace and be born into the family of God. Or we can choose to go our own way. We can choose... That path towards hell. But I want you to know that if you want to choose that path towards hell, you'll have to step over a bloodstained cross. Yep. God put everything He could in your way to keep you from destruction. God done everything He could to keep you out of hell. He sent Jesus to lay down His life to pay for your sin. And now He sent the Holy Spirit to draw you to Himself. This morning you can choose to turn away that Holy Spirit. There's somebody in this room right now. And I don't say this a lot, but... The Holy Spirit's been dealing with you this week. He's been stirring something up in you and you feel uncomfortable right now. He's been dealing with your heart and you know you're separated from God. You know your life's never been changed. You, know, you may be here and you may have been in this church for 20 years. But the Holy Spirit's been stirring in your heart this week. Convicting you of your sin. You know that the Holy Spirit's been drawing you. Friend, could I tell you that it's time to surrender. It's time to surrender. The Holy Spirit's drawing you. The love of God is compelling you. And salvation comes down to one word, and that's surrender. God isn't wanting you to clean up your life to come to Him. God's not wanting you to, to get everything right before you come to Him. He wants you just as you are. Just as you are. Stop trying to clean up your life and just give it over to Him. Salvation comes down to that one word. Surrender. It's just saying, I surrender to you, Jesus. I give you everything. 
I give you everything I have. It's believing the message about Jesus and confessing Him as Lord.